Uh, hi, good morning, and welcome to Vintage Faith Church Online. Uh, if this is your first time here, uh, I would invite you to uh, maybe contact our, our pastor, Kenan. Uh, his email address is at the bottom of the screen. Um, a couple of reminders this morning. Uh, just continue to, to keep praying for uh, our community and our country and, and individuals, uh, and a reminder to keep praying for the Zimmerman family and their uh, little baby, Josiah. Continue to keep reaching out to them uh, and, and staying in connection with them. Uh, this morning, we're going to uh, sing a song after this introduction, uh, and then I'd invite you to pause the video uh, to pray for a minute, um, and then we'll get into the sermon on Isaiah 24. All right, we're going to sing Be Thou My Vision.
still be my vision, O ruler of all. Still be my vision, O ruler of all. O God, be my everything, be my delight. Be Jesus, my glory, my soul. Well, good morning again. Uh, it's good to see you guys. And uh, as usual, I cannot wait to be back with you. Before I was recording this, I got to see some faces I hadn't seen in a while. I got to see Vicki and uh, Jenny in person, and it uh, just gave me a foretaste of what it's going to be like to be back with you guys. And I cannot wait. I cannot wait. It's going to be good. It's going to be great. Uh, hang in there a little while longer, I think, and uh, we'll be together in no time. We're going to continue going through Isaiah this morning. Uh, specifically, you're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 24. Uh, I'm praying that it blesses us. And specifically, what I'm really praying that the Lord does uh, through this in your hearts, and um, kind of what I've built into my essential question this morning is that it makes us a resilient people. And it makes us uh, resilient Christians. And so my essential question is right up that alley. It's, it's how does the gospel make us resilient? As, as believers? How does it make us not fragile people? Um, and so we're going to investigate that <clears throat> out of Isaiah 24, and I'm excited uh, to go there with you. Uh, let's pray. Father, I, um, yeah, I know this room is empty, Lord, but I just pray for all the souls that are listening, God, uh, that are listening right now um, in a strange way. Jesus, I pray that you'd bless their hearts as they listen, that you'd encourage them by this word, that you would make us into people that have you as our deepest treasure. God, I pray for this church. God, I pray that we would be a people that love you supremely and, and that um, are just free in that, that are carefree in that, that are anxiety-free in that, that are able to honestly say, take the world but give me Jesus. Lord, um, I just pray that you'd make us into that kind of people, Father. Make us into the kind of people that can say, take the world, but give me Jesus. I love you, Lord. Um, I pray I love you all the more. I thank you for this word. I thank you for Isaiah 24. I thank you for the gospel. I thank you that you've saved us. Um, amen. So Isaiah, um, like Kenan covered, uh, the last like 10, 11 chapters of Isaiah, I can't remember exactly when it starts, I think like 12 through 23, um, is Isaiah uh, prophesying uh, woes, mostly woes, against the whole world. So Isaiah turns his attention in Isaiah 1 through 12 uh, from looking at Israel to turning and looking at these nations like Egypt and even Assyria and Babylon and Tyre and uh, Cush. And, 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 <clears throat> and he pronounces woe and judgment against many of them and, and others just general words of prophecy. And as we turn to Isaiah 24, the, the headline in my Bible, I think it's a fairly good summary, is, is judgment on the whole earth. 
And so in one sense, you could say that this chapter is kind of a summary of the last 11 chapters. It's a summary of Isaiah's prophecy against not just Israel, but the whole world. And uh, this is a great reminder. Um, this is a great reminder for us uh, that our God is not just the God of Christians. And he's not just the God of Israelites. That uh, it, you might, it, it would be a good question if you were opening your Bible with a non-believer, you were with somebody for the first time, and if they asked you, why does God pronounce judgment against Egypt, right? Like, Egypt has their own gods. Why, why is he talking to them? That would, that would be an insightful, that would be a good question. In fact, one of the um, objections to the gospel, maybe one of the more clever ones that I've heard, is, is somebody doesn't follow God because they believe God's a racist. That God uh, made the world and then he chose one people and he made those his people and he's following uh, and he's bringing those people to himself and he doesn't care about everyone else. And, and Isaiah, what we just read, refutes that. It shows us, no, God saved Israel in order to be a blessing and a priesthood to the whole world and God is still the God of the whole world. And so this concept uh, of seeing God talking to other nations, it, it has some implications for us. And it has some implications for our neighbors. This, this idea might be abrasive, but what it really means is that our, um, maybe, maybe you have a neighbor that doesn't believe in God at all, maybe like an atheistic neighbor. God is the God of that neighbor. Uh, just because somebody denies God, it does not mean that he is not their God, so to speak. I'm using that term, their God, loosely. Not, not in a salvific sense, but in a sense that there is only one God under heaven. And so if you are a, um, if, if you're Hindu and you worship many gods, all you've done is turn from the true God to worship idols, to worship what is not really God. This is what we believe as Christians. We believe there's one God under heaven and, and that all will be judged by this one God and for their relationship to this one God. And so what that means is, is that all of us, all of us have turned astray from this God. All of us have, have rejected him. In one sense, every sin <laughs> is a rejection of God. Every, every time we lie, every time we steal, every time we cheat, it's us saying, I want this more than I want God. I don't want you right now, God. I want this. And it's a rejection of God. And not only that, but we've all been born with, with uh, some kind of knowledge of him. We've all been born innately with a knowledge that there is a God. Again, not in a salvific sense, but, but even uh, your friend that maybe was not raised in a Christian home has had to quell and suppress their knowledge of God in order to be an atheist, in order to live that way. And so what that means is that everyone is held accountable. Everyone is held under sin. This is Romans chapter 3. And so because uh, our God is a perfect judge, a good judge, a good God, that means that he will judge the world. Uh, that, that means that he will come in one day for a final judgment, and Jesus will come and, and he will repay the world for their deeds. And that's what we're going to turn and we're going to read about, starting in verse uh, 1 of 24. Let's just read the entire chapter together, and then we'll talk about our central question. We'll talk about where the gospel fits into this. We'll, we'll talk about our hope of salvation in the midst of some of these uh, scary verses. And um, hopefully the Lord uses it to make us resilient people in the gospel. So verse 1 says this, it says, Behold, the Lord will empty the earth and make it desolate, and he will twist its surface and scatter its inhabitants. And so you can hear the strong judgmental language. And it shall be, as with the people, so with the priest, as with the slave, so with his master, as with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the creditor, so with the debtor. The earth shall be utterly empty and utterly plundered, for the Lord has spoken this word. The earth mourns and withers. The world languishes and withers. The highest people of the earth languish. The earth lies defiled under its inhabitants, for they have transgressed the laws. They have violated the statutes, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse devours the earth, and its inhabitants suffer for their guilt. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are scorched, and few men are left. The wine mourns, the vine languishes, and all the merry-hearted sigh. The mirth of the tambourines is stilled, the noise of the jubilant has ceased, the mirth of the lyre is stilled, no more do they drink wine with singing. Strong drink is bitter to those who drink it. The wasted city is broken down. Every house is shut up so that no one can enter. 
There is an outcry in the streets for lack of wine. All joy has gone dark. The gladness of the earth is banished. Desolation is left in the city. The gates are battered into ruins, for thus it shall be in the midst of the earth among the nations. As when an olive tree is beaten. I hope you recognize that reference. As at the gleaning when grape harvest is done. They lift up their voices. They sing for joy over the majesty of the Lord. They shout from the west. Therefore, in the east, give glory to the Lord. In the coastlands of the sea, give glory to the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. I'm going to pause there. And so uh, let's just begin to kind of break down this text, uh, starting with verses 1 through 3. Uh, We hear verse 1, behold, judgment is coming. And that's going to be Jesus. He's coming to judge the earth. And then this is a a wonderful, I think, wonderful statement that is said here in verse 2. It says, it shall be with the people, so with the priest. And so he goes on, with the creditor, so with the lender. So uh, with, with the person of high status, so with the person of low status. And I want you to just meditate with me on this, on what this might mean. Okay, so uh, you got to kind of picture this. You got to think about it. What's going on? Jesus is coming back and he's judging the world. And what's he saying? He's saying that these two people of different statuses, let's, let's take specifically the priest and the people. These two people of different religious statuses um, will be treated the same. So, um, so what does that mean? It means when Jesus comes back, it means that, specifically in this case, religious status and religious works, uh, it, it doesn't hold value. It, it means it doesn't really matter, eternally speaking. And so we can go on, as with the slave, so with the master. When Jesus comes back, eternally speaking, socioeconomic statuses disappear. They don't matter. As with the buyer, so with the seller. How much stuff you have will not matter. As with the lender, so with the borrower. As with the creditor, so with the debtor. Your debt won't matter. The amount of money in your bank account will not matter. The only thing that will matter in that day is if you know the Lord Jesus. Do you know the Lord Jesus? And so for Christians, uh, what this means is when Jesus comes back, it, it means that the rich, they should boast in their humiliation. They should boast in the fact that even though I'm rich, I've seen that I'm a sinful man and I might have a lot of money, but but I am in desperate need of Christ and the gospel lowers them. And if you're poor, you should boast in your exaltation in the gospel is what James teaches us. It means when when Christ comes, he says, even though you're poor, even though you have very little status or money or, or respect in this world, I love you. I value you. I call you a children or a child of God, and and you should boast in your exaltation. And so the rich and the poor are equal in the end times. For Christians, they are equal. And for non-Christians, it's similar. The rich man in that day will recognize he is under sin just the same as the poor man. The the pastor that doesn't actually believe in God is is under uh, the weight of his sin just the same as the people that he's been preaching to his whole life. He'll stop and he'll say, none of it mattered. None of it mattered. And if it doesn't matter then, if it doesn't matter in in eternity, I would argue that that for us Christians, at least for sure, for us Christians and for anyone that is starting to believe this and starting to look forward, it means it doesn't matter now. It, it, I mean, in one sense, it does matter, right, that, that, that we have money in our bank account or don't. Like, like for practical day-to-day living, that matters. But, but I agree with Paul when he says, uh, I consider all these things as rubbish compared to knowing Jesus. All these things don't matter compared to just knowing Jesus. This is, this is everything for us. Everything can be found in just in knowing Jesus. And so uh, this, is, um, this is critical uh, and really important. Um, because it, it shapes the way that we live now. And it, and it shapes what we value. Looking forward to Jesus' coming judgment. None of these things matter. Status, wealth, religious works, class, it never mattered. And when Christ comes back to judge the world, these things will be apparent. But as we keep reading, we can see that not only do these, these um, loves, I'm going to say, not only do these loves not matter, but they're harmful. Read with me in verse 3. It says, The earth shall be utterly empty and utterly plundered, for the Lord God has spoken this word. The earth mourns and withers. The world languishes and withers. The highest people of the earth languish. The earth lies defiled under its inhabitants, the inhabitants that were supposed to care for it, the inhabitants that were supposed to go and make the world like Eden in the beginning. 
and instead it languishes and it withers under these people. For they have transgressed the laws, they have violated the statutes, they have broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse devours the earth, and its inhabitants suffer for their guilt. And so what Isaiah is telling us here is, is not only do, does loving money or status or um, your job or your respect from your coworkers, not only do none of these things genuinely and eternally matter, but, but loving them is harmful. And loving them will consume you. I've, I've got a quote here from a guy named David Foster Wallace, and he was a, he was a poet, and he was, he's not a Christian. He, he committed suicide shortly after writing this, actually. And at a graduation, um, this is what he said. And this is, I think this is incredibly insightful um, of him. Uh, he said, everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. You will never feel like you have enough. Worship your body and beauty and, sexual and sexuality and you will always feel ugly. ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. Worship power, and you will end up feeling weak and afraid. And you will need ever more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect, <clears throat> being seen as smart. You will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. But the insidious thing about these forms of worship is they're unconscious. They are our default settings. It's almost shocking that he would say that. It, it almost sounds like a Christian saying these things. And yet, uh, and yet it's, it's, it's a man that doesn't believe in God, that doesn't know God, that committed suicide shortly after. And yet, I think the things he's saying is, are true. That our loves and our idols and the things that we worship, if they are not God, will eat us away, will destroy us. The, the, anything that we make ultimate will become a demon and will crush us. Make your marriage ultimate. <laughs> make your spouse ultimate and see them try to hold up the pressure of making your life meaningful and watch them crumble. And you too, in, a, in, a, in sadness that it didn't work out. No, no what we learn, uh, what, what Jesus can't, comes to show us is that he is, is the only one that can be exalted, lifted high, and worshipped without devouring us. He's, he's the only one. And, and he's the only one that can, that can stand the weight of being our God, because he is God. And so not only does, does, do these loves of other things, not only do they, um, are, they, are they meaningless on the coming day, um, and not only will that be apparent when Jesus comes, but it'll be apparent that, that this false love has destroyed us. And I think we can probably all think of ways where false loves or, or loves that are misplaced have, have really wrecked our lives or lives of people that we really care about. And it says that these, these false loves are ultimately what causes the earth to be under a curse, what causes this earth to not be the way it ought to be. And, and my mind immediately goes to Romans 8. I think of uh, Romans 8 that's groaning, longing to be freed and to be set free unto, into the, the, uh, the children of God. Uh, longing to be set free uh, from uh, this, the, the people that rule it now and, and instead to be uh, ruled by the, the, the children of God. But there's something interesting, as you guys were reading, I, I, I hope you found it interesting, is, is that we're reading these things and they're really intense. They're really dark, they're really scary, they're really, um, they're really bad, right? Like there's no more mirth, <laughs> there's no more good news, there's no more laughter, there's no more jubilant noise. I'm, I'm down here in 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. There's an outcry in the streets, all joy has gone dark, for thus it shall be in the midst of the nations. And then almost immediately... In verse 14, Isaiah makes a 180 degree turn and he says something shocking. He says, in this situation, in the midst of this darkness, in the midst of this pain, in the midst of this uh, just very real life, this is what we see. He says, they lift up their voices. He says, they sing for joy over the majesty of the Lord. They shout from the west. Therefore, in the east, give glory to the Lord. And the coastlands of the sea give glory to the name of the Lord. We're getting this image of people shouting from the west and from the east and calling people in the whole world to give glory to, earth, to God. And I want to know, who are these people? I want to know, who are they? Who are they? 
And, and I would argue that these people are the people that have not fallen in love with this world, but they're people whose hearts and minds have been captured with love for Jesus and love for God. They've tasted him. They've seen him. They say, I believe you. You're the only God and that you loved me enough to die for my sins. And that is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And I'm going to follow you. You're my greatest treasure. And, and they follow him. And <clears throat> I think Revelation 18 exemplifies this the best. And so <clears throat> Revelation 18 is again talking about judgment on the earth, and it's showing what uh, Christians will be like when they respond to this. And so John, the writer of Revelation, is writing, and he's, he's talking about how um, this great city representing, um, representing the world is going to be thrown down, and all of its riches and wealth and, and material possessions are just going to be counted for nothing. And it says that the merchants of these wares who gain their wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her, weeping and mourning aloud. They're mourning over the destruction that's happening. And they'll say something like this, Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels and with pearls, for in a single hour all this wealth has been laid waste. Can you see where their love is? I think you can see it. They loved the wealth. They loved the money that it brought them. They loved the status. They loved the luxury. They loved the comfort. They loved all these things. And so they wail in that day. And in a moment, everything that they love is taken from them. And yet, we can go down to 19 and 20, and in 20 we see this. It says this, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. Who rejoices when, when the world is thrown down? Who rejoices when, when the sin stops? Who rejoices when judgment is dealt? Who rejoices when things are finally made right? It's only the people who love the Lord God with all their heart. And it's the only people. And everybody that loves all these things of the world, they, they, they're crushed in this day of judgment. They're crushed. And so getting back to our central question uh, of how can we be a resilient, how does the gospel make us a resilient people? Uh, we have this amazing truth that if Jesus is our deepest love, and I'm going to say this with as much conviction and force that I can, hoping that I don't regret holding back in this after this. I just, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. I long for this church to be a church that believes this next statement, that lives in this next statement, that experiences this next statement. But if we are people that love the Lord God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength, if we, if we are the people that love God more than anything in this world, then we are a people that are untouchable by the world. Here's what I mean. If, if I love the Lord God with all my heart, I have peace in the midst of hardship because if my house, let's, let's say my house gets destroyed in a hailstorm, <laughs> it's not my greatest treasure. And so I can deal with it. It's, it's not my greatest treasure, so I can handle it. When Christ is my deepest love, I am secure. I, I cannot be shaken. And so when coronavirus hits, and, and maybe you lose your job, and I'm, I don't want to be sensitive here. I know there are people that this is genuinely your situation, and I pray you've experienced this peace, and you look and that money stops coming in, <laughs> and your true peace and your true joy and your true hope is in Jesus to take care of you. Now and in eternity, you can be at peace. You can. You can be secure. Whatever is taken away from you, nothing can take Jesus away from you. I think this is what Paul experienced. He was in prison, and, and it's like, so I'll preach to the guards. You cannot take Christ away from me. If I die to, to die as Christ, or to, to live as Christ, and to die to die as gain, either way, I cannot lose. If we are Christians that love Jesus, we are resilient. We cannot lose because nothing can take him away from us. We cannot go, we cannot escape from his spirit. We cannot go from him. Nothing can take us away from him. He has an eternity waiting for us that is imperishable, undefiled, and it cannot be spoiled. And so if we're a people that believe the gospel, and we're resilient people, because nothing can take our deepest hope and our deepest treasure away from us, I pray that you would be people, that you would just meditate on that. Just think about that. Just think about the truth of that. Let it sink into your heart. Let it become a reality for you. And so not only are we secure, people that are at peace, that cannot be shaken, I think that it makes us people that are courageous. I think it makes us people, um, I think it makes us people that, that, that we can stare into our souls 
We can stare into some of the, the things that we like the least inside of there, and, and we, can be, we, can, we can be courageous about this. I recently listened to a, um, a devotional uh, from Campus Fellowship, our campus ministry. A guy named Eric Semgeno gave it, and he talked about solitude. And he said, solitude is really, really hard for us. And the reason it's really hard is because you get alone in that room, and all of a sudden you have to deal with yourself. And we as a people in our culture today are so afraid of those moments of silence where we have to deal with our emotions and deal with our true selves and our sin and the things we're afraid about that we will go to great lengths, great lengths to distract ourselves from ever having to stop and and look within. We get into an elevator. I don't know if you get onto an elevator much in Manhattan, Kansas, but if you get onto an elevator, you'll notice almost immediately phones go out. And I would, I think probably most of us, even if we're absolutely alone on the elevator, get our phones out. It's not just social awkwardness. We are even afraid of what's inside of us. We're even afraid. But what the gospel says is that we're a people who have been known by the God of eternity, that he's looked into our hearts more deeply than we ever could, He's looked inside of us, and he has stamped us with his approval of excellence by his son's blood. Not because we find great things in there, not because we find things that are uh, so wonderful about us, but just because he's loved us and embraced us and accepted us. And if we've been so accepted by that God, then now we're able to stop and to look within ourselves and find out what's really going in, and we can face it, and we can be honest about it, and we confess our sins to one another, and we're not threatened all the time. Not only does it make us brave to face our inner fears, but it, it makes us brave to face our, our once without. I just recently, I'm in the process of buying a house, and I had this temptation to be afraid, like, oh no, what if I can't make my monthly mortgage payment? Like, what if something happens, and you know, we're paying more per month, and I, just, I can't make this happen? It was just a genuine fear that rose up within me. And here's how I, I would always counsel you. Look, let's never be people that address our fears by saying that probably won't happen. That is a worthless way to address your fears. Let's never be a people like that at this place. Instead, let's be a people that say, okay, that might happen. That might happen. And the reason it's a fear is because it's a possibility, usually. And it's just an incredibly irrational fear, which (laughs) I know those exist. But most fears, there are fears because there's a possibility of them happening. And so what the gospel enables us to do is it enables us to say, okay, what if it did happen? I would still be okay. Okay, I'm buying this house. I'm afraid. Should I pull the trigger? Should I do this? Should I not? What if I can't afford the monthly mortgage payments? I've done all the math. I think I can. I'm being responsible, but I've still just got this fear. What if I play it out? Okay, I can't make the payment. What's the worst thing that could happen? I I sell the house or uh, the bank takes it back. (laughs) So so what? (laughs) The humiliation of telling my friends I, I lost my house. The pain of knowing that, that um, I, I, in one sense, let down the bank that was trusting me to make payments with this, this money. All of these things pale in comparison to the fact that my God has given me eternal salvation, stamped me with his approval of excellence, called me his child, and nothing can take that from me. So I can handle my house getting foreclosed. It will not crush me because I love Jesus more than I love my reputation, more than I love this house, more than I love money, more than I love my credit. I love the Lord. And because of that, I'm resilient. Because of that, I can handle it. Because of that, I'm courageous. I can face my fears. I can say, okay, I'm going to buy this house. I'm I'm going to do it. (laughs) Now, this is not an excuse to make foolish decisions, (laughs) saying, well, whatever, I have Jesus, so it'll all work out. That's that's not what I'm saying. But it does enable us to be courageous, and it does enable us to look within ourselves. It does enable us to be a resilient people. And not only that, but when Christ is our deepest love, I think it enables us to love genuinely. It enables us to be people that really, truly love because we no longer need from people. You can, you can walk up to me and you can slap me on the face. And because Jesus has filled me with his love and acceptance, I am able. It's possible. I'm not saying I'll be perfect at it, but it is possible for me to love you. It is possible for me to turn the other cheek because I don't need anything from you. It's possible for me to love my kids because I don't need them to prove that I'm an amazing father because I've already been stamped with the approval of excellence by Jesus. I don't need them to behave like perfect robots so that I look good in front of other people because Jesus has already washed me clean and I'm enabled to just love them. I'm enabled to just love my wife, love my friends, love the lost. I can just love because Jesus has first loved me. And so Jesus is our deepest love. It makes us a resilient people. 
It makes us people, uh, when we love him above all things, it makes us people that are secure in an unsecure world. It makes us people that are resilient, that are strong, that are courageous, that can truly love. And when our loves start to get out of whack, when we start to love the wrong thing, it destroys us and it tends to destroy people around us. And so we have got to constantly be asking ourselves, what do I love? (laughs) We've got to constantly be asking each other, what do you love? (laughs) Where is your affection today? Do you love Jesus more than anything else? And we've got to keep that in front of us and develop a culture where we as a group just magnify, treasure, delight in Jesus above all things. And if we do that, I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but if we can grow in this, I think that this can become a place of healing, of joy, of love, of hope, a place where we're secure, where we can have deep friendships and relationships, where we can love the lost amongst us. Things can be really good. And, and I know I'm saying all these things in like a sense of like this is hypothetical perfect situation. And I, and I recognize, I understand that sometimes life happens and you find out like, oh no, I can't, I, like I am afraid, I am insecure, I feel like I have been destroyed by this. I recognize this, and, and I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to be unrelatable or say you have to be a perfect Christian or something. And, and I'm, I'm just always so encouraged by what I read from C.S. Lewis in *A Grief Observed*. Let me just read this quote from you. He wrote this book after his wife died, um, and he was just coping with the grief and, and the hardship from that, wrestling with these thoughts: Is God still good after experiencing this incredible pain, uh, this loss? And, and this is what he says. Um, he says once this. Uh, He says, some people say that um, God sends these things to try us. He says, God has not been trying an experiment on my faith or love in order to find out their quality. He says, he already knew it. It was I who didn't. In this trial, he makes us occupy the dock, the witness box and the bench all at once. He always knew that my temple was a house of cards. His only way of making me realize the fact was to knock it down. And so what Lewis is saying is, if you go back and read a few pages before this, he's railing against God. He, he's saying, you're not good. He's saying, I, I'm angry with you. I'm not, I, I can't believe that you're a good God right now. You're just cruel and vindictive and you're doing this thing. And he's, he's, he's saying that is revealing that there's some things inside of me that even while I was married were always wrong. And the only way those are going to get brought to the surface is when this hard thing happens. My faith gets tested and now I realize, oh man. I really was loving this. My faith was, in one sense, a house of cards. I was lying to myself. When your house gets mowed over by a tornado and you really do realize, oh my gosh, I really did love that house more than I should. And so my prayer is not that we would be people that just get that right perfectly first time, but we'd be a people who are constantly growing in our love for Jesus. We are learning to put to death these idols and these false loves in our hearts, and we're motivating people to do that together. And that we're a group of people that are so committed to one another that when a spouse dies or a house is destroyed or a job is lost, we put the gospel in front of one another and we keep walking with one another. We keep loving one another. We keep placing the gospel there. We we help one another endure to the end. That's my hope. Not that we'll just be perfect right away, but that together we'll grow to love Jesus the way he deserves to be loved. How amazing is that thought? How amazing is that thought of, of a group, of a church, of us just loving Jesus that way and spurring one another on, even in the midst of hardships and trials and tests. It's amazing. And as we keep reading... I find one of the most astounding verses in the Bible uh, that are are helping me to understand my God. All the way down to verse 23, it says this. It says, Then the moon will be confounded and the sun ashamed, for the Lord of hosts reigns on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and his glory will be before his elders. (laughs) I don't know if you just picked up on that, but what what Isaiah, what the Holy Spirit just prophesied is, is that when Jesus comes back, and we see him in his glory. Uh, Revelation tells us that we won't need the sun because God himself will be our sun. That God's glory will be so bright that the sun is going to go, oh, I'm ashamed. <laughs> the sun is going to want to hide its face. It's going to be confounded by the brightness and the glory and the majesty of our God. And so I'm not asking us to love something that's unlovable. I'm asking us to love the most supreme being in the universe, that though he is so holy that he puts the sun to shame, has reached down his hand into this earth and has pulled us out of our sin and darkness and said, I want to make you mine and loved us. How can you not love a God like that? How can you not love a God that loves you despite all of his glory and perfection and he sees us and he knows us and he still saves us? 
I'm calling us to love the most lovely thing in the universe and not these other things. In fact, I think that Ezekiel 16, it, it, I'm not going to read it for the sake of time, but go read Ezekiel 16, the very last few cha- uh, verses. And, and what Ezekiel's getting at is that when God renews his covenant with us and he, and he reveals himself, we will be confounded. Along with the Son, we'll be confounded that we ever loved anything else. We'll be shocked. God will be so glorious, so perfect, so beautiful, so lovely, that when we see it, we'll kind of be like, I cared about money? (laughs) Well, that's the silliest thing in the world. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I did that. This is the image of our God that our, our Bible gives us, and I'm committed to running after loving him like this with you. I'm committed to, as false loves get revealed in my heart, repenting of them with you. I'm committed to calling you to love Jesus and making him as beautiful as I know how in front of your eyes. I love you guys. If we believe the gospel, we will be a resilient, courageous, loving, joy-filled people. And if you don't believe the gospel, I I just plead with you. Whatever you are loving, it's going to destroy you. And I just plead with you to look to this Savior. And if you find yourself able to believe in this moment, if you find yourself being drawn to that God, that it sounds like a fairy tale, but maybe it's all true, I'll just invite you, it is true. It is true. Jesus did rise again from the dead. It is true. As much as it sounds like a fairy tale, he will bring you with him into eternity. I would invite you to believe in him. I would invite you to make your life about him. I love you guys. Again, I can't wait to be with you. I'm going to give hugs. I'm going to do it. I can't wait to see you. Bye. All right, we're going to sing Amazing Grace.
depender 